John D. Rockefeller Sr. said, A great responsibility rests upon newspapers. There is an ethical duty they owe to the community which I sometimes feel they regard too lightly. These stories about my wealth have a bad effect on a class of people with whom it is becoming difficult to deal. The stress which is laid in those stories arouses hatred and envy, not against the individual, but only against organized society. It is the general trend I have in mind which is arraying the masses against the classes. Well, John D., wherever you are, we'll do our best tonight on alternative views. Welcome to Alternative Views. Tonight, with the death of Nelson Rockefeller recently, we take a look at the vast empire of the Rockefellers, both historically and we take a look at their activities. But before then, we go to the news as usual. Frank, for the first story. Well, you remember a while back when Carter said, okay, nobody's going to get any more than 77% raise, and the corporate managers and the executive pay specialists were just aghast. But they're all smiles now because the old double standard's coming back into effect. The government workers, of course, they're, if they're lucky, they're going to get seven. The unions, they're settling uh, for seven many places. However, these rules aren't expected to disrupt most of the corporate compensation programs because the companies are going to be allowed to decide how they want to divide up the uh, company pot under this 7% guideline. Some executives can get more than seven, some less. And the administration is exempting from the bonus guidelines these bonus payments based on last year's performance. So the employers are given some flexibility to exempt subsequent bonuses if they're based on profit margins which prove unexpectedly high. Un right? Unexpectedly. <laughs> yeah. And it also um, allows the employers to exclude from the guideline uh, the effects in legitimate promotions and changes in workforce compensation. So now the businessmen are smiling again, and they're heaping praise in the White House on wage and price stability. Are these the same people that were asking us to tighten our, tighten our belts here a few years ago and learn how to live with a reduced standard of living? Yeah. Today we got two economists here with us, so I'm asking, what is the significance of this? Uh, there was a little mention in the Wall Street Journal that foreign holders of U.S. debt received $15 billion in interest in 1978. Does that have any particular significance? as far as our economy or the continuing uh, taking over of uh, industries and land by uh, foreign interests, or does it have any significance that's been going on all, all these years? Maybe for purposes of identification, joining us on the panel this evening is uh, Harry Cleaver from the Economics Department for an encore performance. He really did a smashing job a few weeks ago when he came and talked about inflation. He's going to join us tonight talking about the Rockefellers. Smash Rockefeller tonight. Yeah, no, no comments on the 18 well, billion the, in interest? Yes, <laughs> the interest primarily uh, comes from U.S. government bonds which are being sold abroad uh, to finance the, uh, the national debt. It's a new development and they're being called Carter bonds. Uh, many of them are being, uh, bonds are being sold for foreign currencies and interest is being paid on that. Uh, the other part, interest can come from you know, regular stock, uh, stock holdings, other forms of non-governmental bonds, I suppose. But the outflow of debt itself, uh, the payments on the debt, is to be expected from that. Right. Uh, from that. Well, we're talking about Rockefeller, and that means millionaires. The, the uh, spotlight had this report. There in uh, 1952, there were 13,000 millionaires. But 1979, we have a quarter of a million of them. However, for a millionaire in 1979 to make as much as a millionaire in 1952, he would have to have $7,692,307.60. And well they're biting the bullet, aren't they? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well over 50% of the millionaires are women, too, Frank. Oh, well, they are. Yeah. At least we discriminate <laughs> on this program. That's right. Um, we have a media report here in just a second uh, with uh, Doug, but 
I don't know if you have this one about William Buckley, you know, that pom moral pontificator, you know, the guy with a big vocabulary. He one of the funniest word. stories I've read in a long time, but go ahead, Frank. No, well, if you've got to go, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, it's anyway, um, Buckley ha personally has to repay more than $600,000 to stockholders of a company, the uh, Star Broadcasting Group of which he was chairman. The Securities and Exchange Commission ruled that Buckley and other directors fleeced the stockholders for Buckley's personal expenses by employing devices, schemes, and artifices of fraud, and they made mistake, uh, misstatements of facts and operated as a fraud and deceit in their manipulations of corporate property. I mean, he's a staunch defender of free enterprise, too, <laughs> isn't he? Basically, they were very inefficient, and they lost a lot of money, and in order to cover their debts, they fleeced the uh, stockholder. Buckley uh, almost lost his entire fortune on this and said he's never going to get engaged in any business ventures again. This is pretty funny for someone who has been a high priest of private enterprise and all of his benefits to the individual in the country. He himself nearly gets destroyed through his bad business practices. I, I yeah. noticed that the, uh, the title of that story, the headline is called Buckley Admits He's a Dummy. <laughs> I don't know. Well, see, the thing is, Buckley, I, they, they say there that Buckley uh, says that he knows every word in the dictionary. But Buckley's defense on uh, in this regard said, well, I didn't understand what was lawyers were saying in all those contracts. But anyway, what else happened in the media out there, Doug? Well, there's certain processes are now underway which may radically change the structure and the nature of the American broadcasting system. For instance, the Carnegie Commission on the Future of Public Broadcasting filed a report recently after meeting for 18 months and proposed a larger budget of $1.2 billion a year to finance public broadcasting. This would mean there would be an average of $5 per person to fund the uh, public broadcasting in America and that this money would come from the networks and the broadcasters who would have to pay a spectrum fee for the use of the airwaves, which are said to be part of the public domain. What this would mean is two things, basically. One, there would be less um, centralization because there would be more programs produced, and therefore each local public broadcasting station would have more autonomy to choose from the programming. Hopefully, this would also mean better programming also, and in fact, on Sunday night, there was a new program on PBS shown called Nonfiction Television that had a documentary featuring Paul Jacobs and the Nuclear Gang that was one of the most explosive and exciting documentaries I'd ever seen on television. So it's to be hoped that through better financing of documentaries and public television that there will be better uh, television in the American system. It's interesting that the Carnegie Report attacked very strongly the network television for its low quality TV failing to meet the public needs for information and quality entertainment. And there's been a whole raft of voices that have seconded this uh, report. For instance, the FCC commissioner made a speech a couple weeks ago, Charles um, Ferris, urging that the government communication policy should further more diversity and should promote cable tech TV and new technology that would create more diverse and better innovative television. Interestingly enough, even the network executives themselves are aware that their days are perhaps numbered if they don't produce better television. Some ABC top executives the other day in this um, meeting uh, told this convention that the network of the future would be mostly sports, news, and uh, special events programs, and that entertainment would mostly be through video cassettes and special uh, production companies. But perhaps the most interesting uh, indication that the networks are aware of the low quality of their entertainment and the need for better quality television comes from none other than Will William Paley himself, who uh, in his memoirs that are going to be published uh, next week called As It Happens makes the proposal that um, each network should put two hours a week aside for quality television production. Unfortunately, Paley has gotten a cold shoulder from the other network executives who don't want to sacrifice even two hours of their precious time for higher quality television. Anyway, there's interesting changes underway in the American TV system that we will keep you aware of and keep 
analyzing the failures or perhaps successes in the following days. So how, how significant an increase is it uh, in the budget? Uh, you say that the proposal is $1.2 billion. What was it previously? Well, it previously? Um, previously it came to about $2.80 a year per person, whereas now it would be $5. So it's almost doubling the budget. So that's the most significant proposals that have ever been made for the funding of public broadcasting. And since President Carter argues that he's in favor yes. of more money and, and better uh, public broadcasting, this is encouraging. The question is, can they get the broadcasters to cough up the money through this uh, spectrum fee? So far, they're opposing it, but that the government can uh, force it on them, which would make possible uh, this better public television without any expense for the taxpayer. I've got some <clears throat> labor news here, uh, gleaned from several sources. In 1978, there were fewer strikes than there have been in the past. Well, actually, within 13 years. But these strikes were of longer duration. And there's still a lot of struggles going on. After 18 months of a fight, unionists won contract with Coca-Cola Bottling Company of Laredo. A GM plant in Shreveport is now unionized. It's part of a southern strategy of the union organizers. Efforts are going on in other plants uh, all around the South. The next big one, uh, big target, is Oklahoma City. There's a series of shipyard strikes, too, in Pennsylvania, two of them in Great Lake uh, ports. Uh, these were all settled within that 7% guideline, but there's a contract in Lorain, Ohio, that was rejected. That strike's still going on. Perhaps the most significant one, historically, is the fact that undocumented workers have signed their first labor contract. An Arizona citrus farm uh, grower, uh, which is partly owned by uh, the brother of Senator Goldwater, signed a contract with these undocumented workers. Lettuce workers are in strike in California. I guess that's getting a lot of play in the media. For some reason, they selected that one. The big strike in Newport News is still uh, going on with the, uh, against the Tenneco shipyard there. And Harlan County, where the, that just mind-boggling uh, movie was made, Harlan County, Kentucky, 14-month-old strike is still going on. Pickets are mostly women, it's been reported. Uh, there's a lot of violence, uh, mainly from the scabs and the uh, companies. A lot of shooting, dynamiting. Well, here's a question for the economists. <laughs> you already, you already tried that this one. This is the second one. You must, well, the, 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 I didn't if like it, the, the real fast response. If it doesn't so work, float it again. One of these guys, okay. the high priest. <laughs> What do you, now, you know the answer to this, I think, because I gave you what? Well, let's hope so. How much money do you suppose is estimated by the banks themselves that they spend each year in money speculation around the world? Remember that one? In 50 countries around the world, guess how much money they spend? Is this a rhetorical question, or can yeah, I answer it? Do you have any idea? Do you have any yeah, idea $50 trillion in oh, last year alone. You remember. Yeah, okay. $50, 50 trillion, trillion in foreign currency speculation by the banks of the world. And the, remember, for those of you who can't remember, the GNP of the United States is roughly two trillion. So the potential, I think, for destabilization is certainly there at the least. Well, you've got some more economic news. Since you answered the question correctly, <coughs> sir, you got to go on and give some economic. I get to go to the bathroom too. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, actually, my news is, is mostly Rockefeller news, uh, in keeping in, in, in tone with the theme of the program. If um, for those few of you who have managed to hang with us here for these many months. You remember we did a program on the Trilateral Commission, and I believe it was brought out then that one of the central tenets of the Trilateral Commission, which is this think group, or how would you how would you describe the Trilateral Commission? Um, bunch of badasses. Well, no, just a bunch of fun guys oh, who okay. get together and play cribbage and discuss yeah, you know, controlled economic of, systems yeah. or something. Yeah. But uh, one of the central tenets of the Trilateral Commission was to centralize uh, <clears throat> economic decision making and, and control over the the economy. Of course, it's always done in our best interest to, to, <clears throat> to uh, help get us through these rough spots, these, these things that keep happening, these recessions and depressions and what have you. And um, there are some of us who believe that the method of doing this is through the banks, and I mean primarily through banks who are promoting mergers. This is something that's very difficult to prove um, because of the confidentiality of, of most of the information you need to prove that there's something going on here. Uh, but at any rate, in the Wall Street Journal recently, we have a rather interesting article on one of the Rockefeller banks, Chemical Bank of New York, and its attempts to promote a merger between two of its clients, which, if it hadn't gotten messy, would have been, you know, 
It would have been cut and dried and, and it would have been finished with by now, but this is one of these so-called hostile takeovers. Uh, the problem here is that since, Was uh, since Washington Steel and, and Tally Industries are, are both uh, clients of um, Chemical Bank, Chemical Bank is in possession of some very, um, well, they're, they're in, they're in, they stand a, a chance of making a big gain is what I'm trying to say, actually. They, they, have, a lot of, well, they have an awful lot of inside information. Uh, of course, the banks counter with the Chinese wall argument that, all right, we have trust departments who buy stocks uh, for their clients. Of course, the banks buy stocks, though this is a no-no. Uh, banks buy stocks by creating Hickory Dickory Dock, mm -hmm. was it? Mm -hmm. Hickory Dickory so, Dock, yeah, yeah and, and all these fictitious street names. But they also have loan departments, and most of you, like myself, have been to the bank at some time or another, gotten a loan, and you know that you pretty much have to bare your, your bottom to them and tell them everything about you. Well, here we have a bank that is in possession of all the the uh, the most secretive of financial data of these two companies and they have a trust department who owns stock and and so the potential for conflict of course is, is, is fantastic it's like leaving money laying around the streets expecting us not to pick it up but at any rate the banks counter that they have created invisible Chinese walled in other words the people in the trust department never talk to the people in the loan department well, at any rate, uh, some of the language in the article in the Wall Street was rather, rather cute, and I thought I'd, I'd, I'd bring this out here. Um, by the way, this, this, this was, um, <clears throat> there, uh, there was a judge who was basically, I guess, an orphan's court judge in Washington County, PA, and he was interested in, in uh, the, this Chinese wall idea, and he randomly, I guess, was assigned this case. Otherwise, I think the, the entire merger would have gone through and, and nobody would have been the wiser. But... Um, this is, the, this is the judge, I think, talking about the Chinese wall. A chemical bank's attorney argued that the bank has established a Chinese wall that effectively prevented the bank's southwest regional man manager, who is responsible for the tally account, from getting any information about Washington Steel from the bank officer handling that account. But it was also disclosed that the two account managers met with an executive vice president of the bank who had overall responsibility for corporate loans in a five-minute meeting. Okay, we're talking about, you know, big bucks, about 70 million or so. We have a five-minute meeting um, of the executive vice president who authorized the tally loan, and he uh, authorized these people to go ahead and make the loan. The judge um, contended that a responsible bank vice president does not make a $70 million loan in five minutes. I think that's a reasonable assumption. Um, either Chemical Bank needs a new vice president, or else the man has checked things out with his, his cohorts. But um, this thing is still going on, isn't it, Frank? By the way, Chemical Bank is a Rockefeller bank, and it was put together in '55. Uh, as a result of a merger between the corn, chemical corn exchange and the New York Trust. Uh, You're going to get into some of that more later. Yeah. In the day, aren't you? Well, thank you. I've got a quote here. We've got to have a quote for the day, and this is uh, from the book The Rockefeller Syndrome by Ferdinand Lundberg. And you can see it's seen better days, so old John D., I guess. But anyway, he says, anybody who attempts to write realistically about the American political economic scene is going to find out that he's a muckraker. How's that? Shall we muck a little rake? Yeah, let's uh, do some muck raking. I like negative naysayers of negativism, actually. Negative nabobs of negativism. Remember that? Spiro Agnes? Spiro. Whatever it was. Well, what we would like to do tonight is to have an in-depth focus on the Rockefellers, seeing how they accrued their gigantic fortune, the historical development of their various diversification, starting off with a fortune in an oil monopoly and then moving to the iron and the steel industries and to diversifying holdings into control of banks, insurance companies, developing the modern conglomerate corporate political structure and also playing a major role in the foreign policy. I'm going to begin with a brief historical analysis of how the Rockefellers first accrued their fortune. My source here is a book by David Collier, by rather Peter Collier and David Horowitz called The Rockefellers, which is an excellent historical account of the fortunes of the Rockefeller family from John D. to the present day. Now, John D. Rockefeller was the first to amass the family fortune and, of course, is one of the most famous Robert Barons in the history of capitalism and in the popular mind for many was the prototype of the capitalist. John Dee was not simply a robber, however, but was the developer of a uniquely American institution, the trust, that became the prototype later for the corporation, the conglomerate, 
and then the multinational. Hence, whereas other robber barons were interested in swindles or monopolizing one corporation or simply in making a lot of money, Rockefeller was interested in evolving a whole corporate structure and financial empire. He got his beginnings in the Civil War when in a grain commodity business he made a lot of money and sniffed profits to be made in the new oil refinery industry. So he got more and more interested in the oil industry and started setting up refineries with other Cleveland businessmen. By 1870 he incorporated Standard Oil as the first uh, major oil corporation. The way he was able to get a monopoly of the oil um, corporate field was through a very sophisticated process of rebates where he made deals with the railroads to give him cutbacks on the rate and for ensuring a steady flow of oil on their lines and was thus able to get better deals for uh, than his competitors which he drove out of business. The way he did this in the final crushing blow was developing what he called the South Improvement Company, where he made secret deals with the railroads, which raised the prices to carry the oil from the fields to the refineries, and then gave rebate to Rockefeller and his friends that drove most of his competitors out of business. It was at this time that Andrew Carnegie called Rockefeller Rockefeller, and the term octopus began to be used to describe the corporate uh, structure of the uh, Rockefellers. So by 1880s, the Standard Oil controlled 95% of the oil produced, and it also won Rockefeller a lot of um, uh, hatred, and he started getting heat from the government. The Pennsylvania legislature declared the uh, South Improvement Company illegal. A lot of people who Rockefeller had driven out of business was suing him. He was getting a bad press, and there was a lot of uh, uproar and antitrust agitation from the muckrakers. Well, Rockefeller then developed a new corporate structure, the trust, to diversify ownership, in which he put the ownership of the oil trust in different names and developed this incredibly complicated corporate structure to confuse the issue of ownership, which was a form, of course, of corporate um, conglomerate structure which the Rockefeller heirs would um, uh, perfect. Moreover, at this time, this is the 1880s, Rockefeller went into foreign oil in a big way and soon controlled the world market. The American government strongly supported Rockefeller's interventions in the foreign oil field and when his massive China market was threatened by nationalist um, agitation, the Secretary of State, John Hay, issued the famous open door policy, which meant basically an open door for U.S. corporations to exploit foreign markets and the threat of military, uh, U.S. military force to back it up. So that in a sense, this is the beginning of a, a corporate imperialist foreign policy in the interest of the um, corporations. With the introduction of the automobile, the combustion engine, as well as airplanes, oil became one of the biggest uh, commodities in the new industrial uh, system. And with World War I, Rockefeller uh, became uh, tremendously famous. He started getting more and more heat, though, from muckrakers, and more and more agitation started to uh, bust up Rockefeller's trust. So he began developing uh, philanthropy. This actually went back to the early uh, 1890s, where Rockefeller's uh, religious conscience, he continually tied 10% of his money, perhaps his guilt, as well as the desire to create a better public image, led him to hire a certain Reverend Fred T. Gates, who started a uh, philanthropy uh, foundation for um, Rockefeller. Well, this too led to increased fortune, as it turned out, for the Rockefellers, because Mr. Reverend Gates was able to acquire certain oil deposits in Minnesota and certain mines in Colorado that enabled Rockefeller to make deals with um, Carnegie and Morgan to establish the U.S. Uh, Steel Corporation, which again uh, increased uh, Rockefeller's uh, corporate uh, holdings. Moreover, Rockefeller seemed to succeed in this time with public relations through his philanthropy, whereas earlier 
in the days of uh, the trust, in the early days of his amassing his fortune, he had a very bad public image as a greedy capitalist. With his philanthropy, people began to soften a little bit, and John D. Rockefeller's public image uh, began to um, soften a little bit. Now, it was at this time that Rockefeller, uh, around 18, um, 1915, began to develop some problems with the uh, labor movement. Jack, do you have a story on um, Rockefeller and the uh, Ludlow mine strike in Colorado? I better. I'm standing over here. Uh, well, it seems that anyone who tuned in for our program uh, a couple weeks ago on labor history uh, probably found out that we have a very bloody hist labor history in this country, and probably some of the bloodiest days of our history is the Ludlow, what has come to be called the Ludlow Massacre, uh, Ludlow, Colorado. It seems that the uh, Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, which was Rockefeller dominated, would not allow uh, the organization of the union. And in the fall of 1913, the workers went on strike for, to recognize the union. Now, that's the bad time to go on strike in Colorado. Uh, they were forced out of the company-owned housing. And I think we have a picture of the company-owned housing. This is not exactly spacious uh, quarters and luxurious quarters to begin with. But uh, the Taj Mahal, compared to what they faced in the, in the winter of 1913-1914, you have here, I think, yes, a tent colony. Now, can you imagine yourself in Colorado pitching tents, women and children? And that's the way they spent until uh, April of 1914 when, I think I have a picture here, the Colorado militia, now, the Colorado militia were not really a, pub a public body, a publicly authorized body. There were co actually co uh, people on the Rockefeller payroll who were put in militia uniforms. And on the morning of April 20th, 1914, uh, they machine gunned the tents. There had been a great deal of rancor and discord between, obviously, the strikers and the, and the authorities. But they machine gunned the tents and set, or set fire to the tents uh, with oil. Uh, burning uh, 13 uh, women and children and killing another 13 strikers, bringing a total of 26 strikers. Uh, this uh, particular episode in American history earned Rockefeller the title of the most hated man in history. And I think we have a, a shot here of the, of the death pit itself where 13 women and children died. What happened was these pits were anticipating there would be gunfire. These pits were built. And when they heard the machine gun fire, the women and children retreated into the pit, but they didn't anticipate that the, uh, the guards would set it on fire. And there was a great deal of public outcry about this, but Rockefeller pretty much, John D. Uh, Sr., at least, defended his position. Uh, John D. Jr. Uh, relented a little bit, but not so much that uh, he would give in. Wilson, eventually, President Wilson sent in troops in April of, uh, of 1914. The troops stayed. The workers facing another strike in December of 1914 gave up. The strike was broken, and they went back to work. Well, that's it, basically. Okay, basically, Rockefeller Sr. refused to allow even the principle of unionization in his companies. John Jr. finally relented and allowed what was later called company unions to be founded in which a group of people in each corporation consisting of the corporate managers and some workers would from time to time get together and discuss problems and grievances. But the Rockefellers uh, opposed unionization uh, constantly. Now, as an aftermath of the uh, murder of all the workers in Colorado, Rockefeller Jr. was called up before the Industrial Relations Commission in Congress in 1915 and questioned as to his policy there. And it's interesting that a uh, union leader, John Lawson of the United Mine Workers, said, it's not their money that these lords of commercialized virtue are spending, but the withheld wages of the American working class. Help for China, a refuge for birds, pensions for New York w widows, and never a thought of a dollar for the thousands that starved in Colorado. The point he was making was that the philanthropy of the Rockefellers that was so widely publicized was financed from the low wages 
that uh, were paid to the uh, workers. Anyway, Doug, Harry, excuse me, you said yeah. he was called in front of a committee, whatever came of it. Uh, mainly, he got uh, a tongue lashing at so. uh, <laughs> this committee that was run by this guy named uh, uh, Walsh, but uh, nothing really came out of it in terms of legislation uh, or any improvements in the uh, workers' um, condition. Now Harry Cleaver is going to tell us how Rockefeller's policy of philanthropy in the South was the model for the program in the foreign policy interventions that the Rockefeller family would later do in their so-called underdevelopment policies. Harry, would you like to uh, begin? Well, I suppose that nothing is easier than to paint the Rockefellers as villains when it comes to, uh, comes to business. More problematic are the, indeed the philanthropies because there was much more to them than simply creating an image behind which Rockefeller could carry out his illegal and, uh, in the case of the Ludlow Massacre's deadly business practices. Around the turn of the century, Rockefeller was involved in setting up a number of philanthropies, and they operated primarily in the South. The General Education Board was set up in 1902. The Rockefeller Sanitary Commission was set up in 1910. And Excuse the, me, the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission? Yes, the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission, which is not a joke, because in that, during the late 19th century and early 20th century, the South had a major problem with hookworm, which is a virulent, uh, debilitating disease in which your intestinal system gets full of yeah. uh, parasites. From walking barefoot, right? That's right. It's similar to schistosomiasis in mm -hmm. the Third World. Thanks to the Rockefeller's expenditures in the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission, hookworm was all but eliminated. Uh, in the United States. The intervention through the General Education Board was a, the essential uh, force which created public education in, in the South, the United States. And third, the interventions of the Rockefellers into agriculture through supporting semen NAPs, de farm demonstration programs, led directly to the Agricultural Extension Service of the Department of Agriculture. In these three areas then, agriculture, health, and education, Rockefeller, through the philanthropy, philanthropies, made a major intervention into Southern society. In, w in a way which one can hardly dispute brought great benefits to the people of the South. Now, the reasons for it, of course, are somewhat different. Uh, one doesn't have to uh, seek purely humanitarian uh, reasons in, for these interventions because, in fact, the architects of these interventions were conscious of the fact that what they were doing was engineering a social transformation of the South to knit it into the larger emerging national economy. And the intervention in education, in health, and indeed in, in the farms was designed to transform the nature of the labor force, to make it more healthy, more productive, more skilled, so that it could be integrated into the emerging industries in the South, in which, of course, Rockefeller and friends had considerable interest. Well. Effectively, this was the first intervention of the Rockefellers uh, and indeed of, of U.S. policymakers in an underdeveloped country because the South was very much an underdeveloped country at the time. And it lay the basis for their subsequent interventions in other parts of the world. Primarily, in the 20s and in the 30s, was the intervention into China. It can be said that in, in the case of China, despite the American open-door policy, American government had no China policy. Its only policy consisted of trying to make sure that American banks, including the Rockefellers, got their share uh, of the loans from the Chinese that were given to the Chinese government. In other words, to make interest, the kinds of interest, Frank, that you were asking about in the case of the U.S. a little while ago. Uh, the major way of exploiting China at that time was to loan money to the governments and then be paid back with interest. And that interest was extracted from the Chinese people. All right? That's, that was the basic the limits of American foreign policy, not for the Rockefellers. Rockefellers went in first in supporting missionaries uh, and then with their own programs to try to f transform Chinese agriculture, Chinese create a Chinese educational system, and to improve the health in China. In other words, they reproduced in China all of the programs that, that they had used in the South, that they had developed in the South. And in fact, they used to bring the Chinese who were being trained for these programs back to the South to observe the programs that they had set up there. All right, those programs in China were very progressive. Nobody else was doing anything like it, except, of course, the communists. There was, as you know, for 40 years, there was a growing revolution in China. Uh, the Chinese co 
Chinese communists of one sort and another were very much interested in the transformation of the countryside against the kind of uh, quasi-feudal, quasi-capitalist social structure that existed at the time. And the Rockefellers were intervening in order to offset their influence. In fact, they intervened in, in order to do what they called setting up a third force. A third force was supposed to be between Chiang Kai-shek, who emerged as the leaders of the nationalists and the warlords that supported him, and the communists a progressive elite who could bring about reform in the countryside and undermine the influence of the communists on the one hand and on the other hand open up China to cooperation with Western business in a way that had never happened before. So that the experience in the South was fundamental uh, in that policy. And that policy, despite the fact that China was lost, was the basic lesson, or uh, laid the basic lesson uh, for American foreign policy in the post-war period. Namely, the need to intervene in the third world to stabilize the countryside, uh, to avert revolution, and make the world safe for multinational corporations and investment. Harry, wouldn't you say that the Rockefellers were the most class-conscious capitalists who were aware that if they didn't develop a uh, progressive industrial structure, social structure, in the third world countries, that they would be, quote, lost to communism? This is. Uh, the sense that I get from at least their Latin American interventions that when Nelson and uh, John Jr. went down there to investigate uh, the oil in Venezuela and the whole social structure of Latin America, they became very aware before any other capitalist did of the necessity of developing social programs that would aid in capitalist development in these countries. Isn't this the case that they're the most uh, class conscious uh, capitalists and that this is the mark of the Rockefellers in both their domestic and foreign policy? Yes, that's very true. Although in this period, most of this work overseas was being carried out by the Rockefeller Foundation uh, in the 20s and in the 30s. In the 30, late 30s and 40s, uh, the, this work by the foundation, which was mainly run by John D. Rockefeller II and then John D. Rockefeller III, was supplemented by the activities of Nelson Rockefeller. In fact, and this is very important to see, the, the sophistication of these people. In 1939, when the Mexicans nationalized the Rockefeller oil interest in Mexico, the, fa the company screamed its head off. Standard Oil wanted, would have had government intervention, boycotts against Mexico, and sent in the Marines if they could have, got, if they could have acquired it. At the same time, Nelson goes down and negotiates a settlement with Cardenas, the president of Mexico, uh, spends the night with him. Uh, in Mexico and comes back with an understanding of the rise of nationalism in Latin America and the need to use social programs to take a conciliatory approach in order to undermine that growing nationalism. In other words, not to respond with a big stick, but to respond in a cooperative kind of way, to make, in other words, to use the carrot, to make, the, uh, make American wealth essential to the stability of Latin America, rather than using the old club that is characteristic of the imperialist period. Okay, well thank you, Harry. Now as an introduction to our analysis of the Rockefeller family's present economic holdings and foreign policies, I might note that the Rockefeller Trust, the Standard Oil Trust, was first busted by Teddy Roosevelt in the so-called trust busting administration uh, at the turn of the century and uh, forced Standard Oil to uh, diversify. However, what this meant in practice was there were many different owners now of the Standard Oil of New Jersey, of Pennsylvania, of New York, et cetera, that maintained a loose cartel under Rockefeller directorship. Moreover, at this time, the Rockefellers actually benefited from the trust busting because they began diversifying uh, their holdings and developed uh, a set of strong financial institutions such as the Chase Manhattan Bank, through which they were able to evolve their uh, corporate conglomerate and multinational um, structures, and also use this as the basis for increased uh, political power. So the genealogy of the Rockefellers was after John uh, Sr. gave over the Standard Oil uh, corpor Corporation to John Jr., he diversified the holdings even more into uh, iron, into uh, coal, 
and made some deals with Carnegie to set up the uh, United Steel Corporation, made some deals with his former enemies, um, Morgan, so that when John Jr. was able to give his empire to his five children, people like David and Nelson and Winthrop, et cetera, they were able to have a tremendous set of uh, holdings, economic holdings of the most diverse sort. And I take it Al is going to uh, analyze some of the current economic holdings now of the Rockefellers. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head there, uh, Doug. The whole I, <clears throat> a lot of people really don't know what the Rockefellers do for a living, and some, <clears throat> sometimes it's kind of hard to determine exactly what sort of productive uh, endeavors that they are engaged in. Uh, they're really not your basic mom and pop grocery store owners, that's for sure. Uh, as Doug has mentioned, uh, they were into oil basically. But I think it's sort of along the lines of a pyramiding scheme. If you can control a corporation by controlling just a small segment of its stock, that's one thing. But if you have a bank, which through its trust departments has lots of, lots of stock and lots of companies, um, <clears throat> you can centralize your control. And this is exactly what the Rockefellers, as well as I guess the other 10 or 12 wealthy, mega wealthy families in the United States learned many years ago that you can control the corporations of the United States better, more efficiently, cheaper, the whole bit by controlling a few financial institutions. Now just to give an example of what I'm talking about, the financial institutions that are, that are known or called as the core Rockefeller group, these are ones that are either founded by Rockefellers or Rockefeller people are on the board of directors. Uh, just the ones that are, that are in this central core um, <clears throat> consist of Chase Manhattan, assets $45 billion, First National City, $64 billion. These are the second and third biggest banks in the United States. Um, Chemical Bank of New York, First National Bank of Chicago, the Metropolitan Insurance Company, Equitable Insurance Company, and New York Life Insurance Company. Uh, the total assets of these seven institutions is $230 billion. Um, a lot of people don't uh, understand the importance of the insurance companies in this, in this control over the economy. The insurance companies um, are, are basically net long-term lenders in the market, while banks lend short to medium terms. But the whole idea is that if you control the, the board of directors, you can control the company. Um, these banks, in turn, and these families, in turn, also form alliances with other families and banks and institutions throughout the United States. Um, Carnegie might have called Rockefeller Rockefeller, but his daughter Nancy married Rockefeller. Um, <laughs> Maybe he called him that after he got yeah, married. So yeah. Now the importance of the New York, the centralization of control in New York, is that New York is basically the wholesale banking capital of the world. What I'm talking about is that New York banks primarily lend money, not to you and I to get car loans, but to businesses to take over other businesses or for expansion or for any sort of thing dealing with business purposes. Um, also, New York is the, the, um, the underwriting capital, I guess, of the country. In other words, all the new stock issues. Um, <coughs> um, to give an example of some of the companies that are under the, the wings of the Rockefeller institutions, uh, either through bank holdings, trust departments, or interlocking directorates, or families that are aligned with the Rockefellers and their holdings. Um, we have DuPont, W.R. Gracie, Corning Owens, uh, Hewlett Packard, Pittsburgh Coke. Uh, I'm just concentrating on ones that you might have heard of. Uh, Standard Oil, Mobile, Standard of California, Standard of Indiana, International Harvester, Inland Steel, uh, Marathon, Quaker, Wheeling, Pittsburgh. Um, Al, don't they most, also most have the um, too. most of the major airlines, uh, a number of the utilities, Con Edison is, 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 I guess it's reasonable to say, Con Edison is, is controlled by Rockefellers. Uh, at one time, the Rockefeller institutions also had 40% of the board of directors of AT&T. Um, Al, don't they also have these things called dummy holding companies in which uh, there's anonymous so-called uh, stock ownership of many corporations that they wield? Names that they wield a, um, a, a power in the corporate policies of corporations that we don't even know about right. through their whole... I think going back to the Glass-Siegel Act, um, the, the, um, the government was um, interested in keeping banks from doing what they had done in the 20s, which uh, helped push us into the Depression, so they, they, uh, they made it a law that banks cannot own common stock. Uh, but they've, always, they've, they've gotten around this through the years by creating fictitious uh, corporations, dummy corporations, as we were 
Jack and I were talking about earlier, Hickory Dickory Dock is one. Um, and these dummy corporations, they exist only on paper. Um, these dummy corporations in turn own common stock. I think Nor uh, is it Northern Industries, one of the big conglomerates, about 30% of its common stock is owned by, by dummy corporations. ABC, NBC, uh, and CBS are also controlled in this fashion. Now, what difference does it make whether or not the control is concentrated in this fashion? What do you mean? In I mean, terms what of difference does it make whether or not these corporations are controlled by a series of independent capitalists or whether or not it's controlled by a single family? I don't, I don't think I understand exactly what you mean. Well, you mean whether they're whole bunch of little capitalists in a competitive situation oh, I'm rather sorry. than a monopoly I'm sorry. situation no, where I've a few people can control and uh, uh, right. direct things and... Well, it also relates into what I'm going to talk about also, which is uh, political political control yep. and direction of the economy. The concentration of, the of so much power enables them to control both economic and political processes. Yeah, but more importantly, I think the access to credit. Credit is not is not traditionally used as an input in most models, but it, probably, it, it is the most important input in the economy. And if you control the access to credit, uh, you, you have the potential for controlling the economy. but As well as the labor force. Take New York City and Cleveland, for instance. If you have uh, a few corporations controlling the political and economic processes of big cities, then they wield tremendous power over them. And we've seen that in the New York City uh, financial crisis, and we see this going on in Cleveland now. And it's no accident that it is banks and insurance companies that are playing a major role in the control of these cities. So I think that this is a... Uh, this is bad for the working class and to develop any sort of progressive politics either in on the local level or the national level if you have such a tremendous concentration of power and wealth. Which, uh, are you, do you have any more to add on that? Because that leads into what uh, I was going to talk about, about the uh, political power of the Rockefeller group in connection with the with the Morgans, they are pretty much one pot anymore, although some of them have uh, basic control of certain financial institutions and others have control of others. But uh, taking this Rockefeller Financial Group uh, publication here, which uh, Al was looking at a while ago, it also has a list of the prime uh, Rockefeller people who are involved in government. Uh, and if for instance, they have a list of 32 men, and they've have held 73 positions, very high positions in government. For instance, 15 secretaries or undersecretaries of state, uh, secretaries of defense or assistant deputy uh, secretaries of defense, five, and on down the line. Frank, these and came it, out of the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, a lot of these people, so this is, again, a political payoff from their philanthropy. Well, these are the, uh, right, these are, uh, speaking of the foundations, there's another list which shows the relationship between foundations, think tanks, and universities, and of the list of 35 of the top uh, Rockefeller people, they have sit on boards of trustees of 20 foundations or funds, universities, the elite universities of the country, 27, think tanks, 9, etc. But this is just uh, a small part of it. When you start looking at the organizations which they control, and which relate then into foreign policy and domestic policy, then you can get the real impact of the, uh, well, you might call it the American um, ruling cartel. We did a program previously about the Bilderberg Group and the Trilateral Commission, and periodically we mentioned the Council of Foreign Relations, which is an extremely important uh, group of uh, top business leaders and financial leaders from the New York area, which once again equates to the Rockefeller Morgan Group. The Council of Foreign Relations was really started back at the end of World War I, but didn't come into its own really until the start of World War II. It's comprised of people, first it was restricted to the top businessmen and financial leaders of Wall Street within the 50 mile radius of New York. It isn't quite that restricted anymore, but still it's mainly the New York, the Wall Street bankers and lawyers who control the steering uh, and advisory committees of it. What they have done over the years um, is basically to do several things. First, set U.S. foreign policy. Second, determine what is acceptable in the way of policies and what is discussable in the proper governmental circles. They've also been very important in, in the determining a consensus and eliciting a consensus from the upper class, the particularly the large corp corporations uh, and the uh, American upper class. 
Now, when I say they largely determine foreign policy, there's a tremendous book which just come out called Imperial Brain Trust by Shoup and Mentor. It talks about the Council of Foreign Relations, and it indicates that starting when uh, starting World War II, before the U.S. entrance into it, the Council of Foreign Relations had some discussion groups, and these discussion groups in turn influenced government because there were people from the Council of Foreign Relations who were in top government posts, and these people were listening to their fellows in the Council of Foreign Relations. So much of our foreign policy, which ended in us getting into World War II against the Japanese, was a direct result of the policy set in the Council of Foreign Relations. Then during the war, the planning for a post-war period, once again was done mainly in the Council of Foreign Relations, and it uh, became so closely allied with the State Department that they actually moved offices into the State Department and uh, the study groups, once again, the output of this actually became foreign policy in the United States. So the, not only just the immediate uh, post-war policy, but also the extended post-war policy, including the uh, policy toward Vietnam, Guatemala, and Cuba, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, these ideas were hatched from the Council of Foreign Relations and accepted by the U.S. government when the government would have various special advisors. Most of these people would be from the Council of Foreign Relations. Right now, there is a study, a 1980s project study going on, which they're determining what the entire international system will be, planning a new world order in which the United States will um, share power with some of its uh, capitalist friends around the world. Now, the Council of Foreign Relations... Frank, can I yeah. intervene? Mm -hmm. Maybe this is on, on a follow-up question to, ha to Harry's. Uh, Harry Magdoff, the author of The Age of Imperialism, argues that in a capitalist society, that, uh, imperialism, imperialism is not a matter of choice. It's a way of life and necessity. How would other capitalists, small-time capitalists, independent capitalists, plural capitalists, have, uh, have brought about a, a different policy outcome as regards to the entrance into World War II or other interventions in, far, in foreign affairs? Well, if you look at the, for instance, you might say that if the Council of Foreign Relations and their outward imperialistic outlook had it not been effective, and had they not had so many people from the Council of Foreign Relations and the, uh, their sympathizers in the government, it might have been then that the uh, Auflandens, the uh, isolationists, <coughs> might have had uh, greater influence in the government. Um, Secondly, uh, there was a great period right after the war in which the Morgenthau Plan, which was wanting a, a rather severe um, peace levied on Germany to not let them come back industrially, to make them uh, a, an agrarian state. Uh, and this was accepted by Roosevelt at first until finally uh, significant pressure uh, was put on by the Council of Foreign Relations and this policy was changed. So I think that uh, mainly, it, indicate, it would indicate that the more moderate wing of the ruling class had its way rather than the more conservative the National Association of Manufacturers or, or the, um, you know, would have had its way. I think but also it, structurally it makes it possible to have a unified foreign policy because if you had individual capitalists each pursuing their own special economic interests, they would be squabbling among themselves all the time. They would never be able to get any sort of unified foreign policy or even a domestic policy. So the fact of having this tremendous concentration of economic and political power centered around the Rockefellers and their various corporations and groups makes it possible to have something of a unified uh, thrust in foreign and dimension policy that wouldn't be possible without this form of organization that's made possible by their concentrations of power. And it makes it much easier for them to plan. Uh, as we see now, they've gotten not just national from a national basis, but an international basis. In the, this brings us to the Bilderbergers and the Trilateral Commission. Now, the Bilderbergers is a super secret organization which includes not only the top uh, U.S. industrialists and financial uh, people, but also their counterparts in the uh, Western capitalist world, particularly the NATO countries. 
This has been meeting since 1954, and I said in, uh, in secrecy. They may take great pains to make sure that nobody knows about it, even though that there have been representatives from the establishment press in these meetings. Very, very little has ever come out about it. Not only are the industrialists and the bankers there, but also selected academicians, uh, government people, many of them who did not become heads of their government until after they attended Bilderberger meetings, and some of them attended Bilderberger meetings afterward. It's very interesting that the Council of Foreign Relations, the head man in that is David Rockefeller. The head man at the Bilderbergers is also David Rockefeller. And the top man of the Trilateral Commission is David Rockefeller. Now, the, the Trilateral Commission is a recognition that they needed to bring Japan in on this international consensus to try to eliminate rough spots and competition wherever necessary and cooperate in controlling the third world. Japan is strong enough now, so they recognize this. Well, the, at a Bilderberg meeting, uh, Brzezinski and uh, David Rockefeller broached the subject. And they thought it was a good idea, so they did set it up. And uh, so now we have the Bilderbergers in a way, kind of the, or the Trilateral Commission is kind of the Bilderbergers out of a closet, plus Japan. Perhaps the most blatant power play has been the selection of uh, Carter to be President of the United States. He was a Trilateral Commissioner, so is the Vice President. And as we show here, 24 members, at least 24 members of the Carter cabinet are from the Trilateral Commission, which uh, shows that they're not just a, a kind of sitting in the background and letting their representatives uh, run the government like they did uh, several years ago, but they actually are doing it on a very concerted and definite basis. And as I said, David, once again, David Rockefeller is uh, the head of the Trilateral Commission. So then we look over the years now at who have been the prime people in the U.S. government. We take a look at the secretaries of state. As you see, a CFR means they're a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. A B means the Bilderberger. And Trilateral TLC is Trilateral Commission. So if we scan down the names of secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, treasury, CIA, special advisors on uh, national security, we find the same people popping up time and again, regardless of party affiliation, regardless of the whoever is in power. Actually, it's the same person in power. Yeah, this all the is time. basically the private government that runs things. Right. So when you talk about the business, you talk about government, you're talking about basically the same thing. Well, Gee, we're running out of government. We're running out of government. We're running out of time. I think you should just say that uh, these are the people who try to run things. Right. Because at the present time, the Trilateral Commission was put together in order to come up with policy solutions to the current economic, international economic crisis, and it so far failed to find a solution. Mm -hmm. So trying mm -hmm. to plan the world Why should economy, they try to find a solution trying if they to can find make a money? solution doesn't necessarily mean that they, that they always do it. Well, Why should they try to find a solution if they can make money either way? It doesn't matter if Iran is communist or anarchist. You know, the oil companies are still going to charge what they want anyway. Well, well we that, that uh, will be seen. I mean, <laughs> they're in an incredible state of anguish right now about Iran because they're afraid that they're going to yeah. lose control of the oil there. Well, I've got a lot of anguish anguish because I wish we had more time to discuss that. Uh, but we've got to sign off now except for a bedtime story. Thank you, Frank. Um, anyone? Uh, this will make some sense of what happened at Ludlow. Uh, in 1914, a popular science monthly issue by a Professor John J. Stevenson, which he wrote, a wife and children cannot be considered in connection with the relations of a wage earner to a wage payer. If a man's services are not worth enough to secure wages which would support a family, he shouldn't marry. One is told that in each year, 200,000 women in our land are compelled to sell their bodies to procure the necessaries of life, and that each year sees 700,000 children perish because their parents had insufficient nourishment. If it be true, one must coincide that their debts are a blessing to themselves and to the community. Such children should not have been born. This article was praised by John D. Rockefeller, Jr. as one of the soundest, clearest, and most forceful pronouncements he had ever read and recommended its use. Capitalist philanthropy. <laughs> See you next week. Thanks for tuning in.